Hello once again everyone, and welcome back to Fights Through History, or From History, or whatever I call the series. And today, as the thumbnail suggests, we're doing a bit of a weird one. So, this is one of, but more famously just called, Talhoffer's Crisis Stance. Now, what this is meant to be is it is a very rare, kind of out of nowhere, and very vague, two versus one scenario in which a person using a sword and buckler against two other assailants, played here by Jake and Randy respectively, also armed with sword and buckler, attack an individual in the middle, who defends themselves on one page, and then magically kills the other on the other page. It's a very strange transition, it's very minimal text, but there is an interpretation of it that I'm happy with, that I'm going to explain in detail as we go through. So, let's set the stage. We're just going to go ahead and show what the plates look like, and you can look these up yourself. The first plate, which we're about to mimic, is the thumbnail. The second one we'll show in a moment. So we start off where um, Jake has just cut down in my head, and he's got that wonderful, terrible use of buckler that Tal Hopper is so famous for. I am receiving this blow with a twisted hand, with my right foot forward. Randy, meanwhile, is uh, right foot forward, and his sword is just up above his head, and my buckler is held, mysteriously with a dagger, just kind of back. This is our first page, and then somehow, we all need to do the following. My sword and buckler disappears, as does Jake's. He then is putting that onto my arm, which I am developing. I am left leg forward, my sword is into Randy's head, and his sword is down on the floor, because he just has a really shitty job at this. So we've got to get from there to here. Now, your first inclination is going to be, what? And honestly, that's my first inclination as well. In fact, uh, Jake here had a particularly good theory that I'm a big fan of, which is Talhoffer put this in the book purely to see whether or not you actually took his lessons. Like, kind of a running joke of, hey, if you see anyone trying to practice this, they probably didn't learn from me. Which I actually like that theory a lot. But what I think this is instead meant to be is it's a couple of different little actions happening within these plays that illustrates just some good habits as well as some things you can exploit. So let's break it down piece by piece. So the most obvious piece, why am I holding a dagger, right? Why am I doing with this buckler, etc.? And why am I holding it out behind me? This, the reason you would hold a dagger in your hand with a buckler is to increase surface area. It's not so that I can stab Randy, though that's certainly cool. Um, and later you will see some options there, but it's really just to make it so that if he wants to cut around, he has to go all the way around the dagger end, which is actually why I think that Randy might, here might be doing um, a left overhaul as opposed to a right overhaul from his dominant side, is because when I hold this back, if he wants to cut from his right, it's more likely to run into the dagger versus cutting from his left, he goes around it. But I can't confirm that. The image, it almost looks kind of straight up, straight down. Not entirely sure. Plus, not to mention, if you're fighting two assailants, just pull out everything you got on you. You might use it. Um, but as far as what's happening here, the twisted hand is very simple. We've seen this already, right? A cut is coming down. All I'm doing is just receiving it by turning my thumb onto the blade. If I were using a messer, I'd be catching on the nozzle, but since I'm using an arming sword, I just catch it on my, uh, my short edge. This is very similar to a shield how, but more as a parry. Works just fine, fantastic parry. Now, the big question on everyone's lips is why is this guy grabbing me as opposed to when I turn around just cutting me in the head? The reason behind this, I believe, is found earlier in the book. If you look at his message section, um, he specifically shows receiving with a twisted hand and then turning this into a pommel hook, and that same action is then later done with the buckler. So basically what's happening, I'll do it on Randy here, basically what happens is someone cuts in and you receive it, you then push forward, hook with the pommel, and push their arm down, and then later with the buckler you do the exact same thing. So my hypothesis is, not only am I setting myself up for the following cut with this parry, but I'm causing Jake to see that. Now he knows that I'm going to be stepping up against him, so his inclination is to try and step up and secure me in some way which allows me to now cut freely at Randy's head. Now, as far as practicality goes, you need to be making sure that you're fighting people who recognize that. But given that I think he's inclined to this sort of thing, and also the twisted hand or catching with the noggle is a very common technique in single hand swordsmanship at this time, it's likely. Um, now, if he chose to do something different, then in theory I could just proceed with my hook um, and then get on the other side of Jake, now Randy has much farther to go. But that's my theory as to why he's coming up and grappling me. Now, why does his buckler disappear? I think that's just an artistic choice, and we'll see that again with mine. So, now 
Now for the second part. My buffer is held out behind me, which is preventing Randy from just immediately attacking me because he has to kind of get around it. Now, if I'm just already in between these two, I'm, I'm dead. There is no way in heck that I'm going to be able to deal with this and I'll spin around and Randy will magically not cut me by now. So what I think this is instead is I realize I'm in a bad spot and I'm choosing to apply myself toward Jake first to buy myself some time between Randy so that when I turn around, I'll have time to bring that cut down. And the way I like to do this is, personally, I like to face one of them first and then step into this parry. So as he cuts, I'm stepping up and slightly crossways. So rather than peer at him, I'm stepping a little bit off the line, which will help me with my next parry. He then sees that I'm going to start. That's when I then turn over, giving me this cut. Now, another fun thing that's I can't necessarily guarantee is intentional, but can happen. Since I made this block with Randy cutting from his left, occasionally you'll actually end up catching his sword as he comes straight down. I don't know if that's necessarily something you're expected to do or if it's just luck, but it did happen every once in a while. If he cuts from his right, I don't really have a whole lot to fear. If I'm swinging around, I am creating uh, a bit of a cover. But another reason I like to do this cross step with this is because with my right foot, kind of on the outside of Jake's right foot, when I turn around, that means my hips are open against Randy, versus if I'm too narrow, I don't get to turn all the way around as easily. And in the final image, he decidedly looks like he's now almost moving off to his left. Now, the next big question, what do I do with my buckler arm to cause me to be interlaced with Jake? My thought is that it's just me pretty much swinging my arm around. So we'll show it slowly first. So I get my block, boom, he looks like he's about to go. And all I'm doing is just swinging that arm over as hard as I can while I bring this cut down. Now, with that dagger and the buckler in my hand, regardless of whether or not I stick him with the dagger, that's gonna suck to just get cracked in the arm or the shoulder with the buckler. I could also be letting go of these. Maybe, I think it's just an artistic choice. But another thing to consider, and I'll put my sword and my buckler down for this, after I get this chop, Jake's hands are probably going to be at least partially on me. At this point, all I'm doing is looking to escape I'm going to just do a slight shrug. And the best way for me to break this grip without turning back into his sword from this position is to just go ahead and keep going with that momentum and try to turn my arm over his. Now, I'm not fully out of the way yet, but it does give me a much better chance of escaping the scary thing, that being his sword. So, all in all, what this breaks down into, you find yourself fighting more than one opponent. Choose the one on your right, as he's cutting down, step up into him with the twisted hand to make him start thinking about the pommel hook. Ward off the other with your sword. Sorry, not with your sword, with your buckler. As he goes to step up against your pommel hook, turn around, and at the same time, throw your arm up high to prevent him from grabbing you. That's where the play ends, but let's go ahead and go follow up. You've now struck this guy in the head. He's not something you need to worry about. Or even if he walks, he, he's still not necessarily something to worry about. Keep moving to your left side and just see what you can get. At that point, I just go ahead and break distance. I'm only fighting one guy now, and he's a guy that I've also learned quite a bit about. And again, maybe that dagger hits him in the head. Maybe it doesn't. But either way, we'll show it um, once more on this side, relatively fluidly. Then we'll switch sides and show it again. And for this, I'm going to go ahead and put my buckler down so I can sweep over a little bit more without cracking Jake. All right, here I am in this situation. Nice and fluid. And that turn, like I said, happens very quick. Now I'll we'll switch sides, show up one more time. And this time I'll have the buckler back in for funsies. This is bad. I'm out of there. I'm out. So, all in all, like I said, could this be a valid interpretation of what Tallhopper wants us to do? In my opinion, this matches all the descriptors and the image, as well as tying back into other behaviors he'd put out in the text already. Do I think this is something you could reliably do in a real life situation? Heck no, right? But there are some useful thought experiments slash lessons in here, right? Limiting which person you're fighting, um, and then also setting yourself up to be able to be mobile. 
I think the idea of using the twisted hand to prompt someone to counter grapple, but then choose not to counter grapple is a pretty cool idea. I think the idea of setting that up into just an overhaul on your other side, that's just fun. Um, as well as I like the idea of warding someone off with your buckler and an extended uh, bit of surface area. There will be times when you need to separate these just to create distance. So again, a nice thing. But all in all, really what I think this boils down to is just a interesting insight into a possible piece of Bushido that maybe I've just found a good way of explaining it. Maybe it is just nonsense. But either way, thank you both very much for joining me. And thank you all very much for watching. Um, the videos are going to slow down for just a little bit. I'm still going to come out with some uh, cool things over the Christmas break, but I will definitely be probably only down to one video per week. But I expect more fun things um, as we march toward the new year. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching. We'll go over some other techniques another time.